There are plenty of objects in the realm of sci-fi and fantasy that act as gateways into a different dimension where something evil awaits. In the classic sci-fi flick Stargate, that was an actual portal to another planet. In Lord of the Rings, the One Ring was a means of power, but also a gateway that allowed Sauron and his Nazgûls to find the Ring Bearer. In Hellraiser, the Lament configuration summoned the Cenobites that have so heavily inspired the design of Berserk's God Hand. But in this manga, the most terrifying key one can obtain is an egg-shaped stone with weird faces on it that ooze bloody tears when activated. The Behelet first appeared in Chapter 0C of Berserk, and till this day, confusion exists around its functions and true purpose in the story. So we thought, hey, we've been on a bit of a Berserk content spree lately, why don't we take a crack at this as well? So here it is folks, the mysterious Behelet and its true purpose in Berserk, explained. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. It's a key to another dimension, but not one you'd like to visit, the Behelet's first appearance. The first time we see a Behelet in Berserk is towards the end of the third prequel chapter, when Guts steps into Vargas's former lab. The Count's former physician discloses to Guts and Puck his terrifying flight from the castle after his master acquired the Behelet and turned into something inhuman. He spent seven years researching every aspect of the Occult, trying to figure out what it was but came up short on every front. This is when Guts explains that the Behelet is actually a key. When activated, it opens the doors to another dimension and summons demons who have been manipulating the dark side of human history for years beyond measure, the God Hand. The Black Swordsman doesn't quite know how the Behelet is used, but he knows that the thing is alive despite its misshapen look. Puck discovers this firsthand after one of the eyes on the Behelet opens up and gazes at him because of his incessant staring. It would appear that Guts is on a quest to understand how to use it, but he also gets to witness this firsthand perhaps unknowingly after his fatal encounter with the Count himself. Having decapitated the slug-like monster, Guts proceeds to treat him like target practice, as the Count cries actual tears of despair. In that moment, his blood flows into the Behelet, which lay on the ground beside him, and a mixture of the Count's emotions and life essence opened up the doorway Guts had been struggling to knock upon for the last two years. After surviving his encounter with the God Hand, during which the Count is swallowed by the Infernal Abyss for rejecting the notion of sacrificing his daughter, Guts discovers that the Count's Behelet was left behind. He picks it up and forges ahead on his path, and the story transitions into the Golden Age arc. So in its first few appearances in the story, we understand quite a few things about how a Behelet works. Through seemingly random means, it finds its way to an individual who holds the qualities for becoming a demon deep in their soul. Once it is acquired by said person, they can use it in their moment of greatest despair to fulfill their greatest desire, providing they sacrifice the very thing that defines their humanity. In the Count's first instance, of ascending to apostlehood, his sacrifice was his wife, but because he rejected his second descendants, we learned that the Behelet doesn't necessarily disappear once its owner does, nor does it become inert after the first descendants. Had the Count gone through with the sacrifice instead of rejecting it, we don't know what the consequences of such a reincarnation might have been. The only apostle who has been reincarnated twice in the story so far is Emperor Ganishka, but his second descendants was forced through artificial means, which caused him to literally lose his mind. If you want to know more about him, check out the Emperor Ganeshka Origins video. It's a good one. Getting back to the point, however, it is clear that despite transforming someone into an apostle, the Behelet continues to remain in their possession, and even after their death, it continues to exist in the physical world as Guts was simply able to take possession of the Fallen Count's Behelet at the end of the Black Swordsman arc. The next time we see a Behelet, it's different in not only its scope, but also its purpose, and yet it is this version of the key that ends up explaining more about its existence inadvertently. The Crimson Behelet, aka the Egg of the King, how a human becomes a god hand. Chronologically, the first time Guts sees a Behelet in Berserk is after his first battle as part of the Band of the Falcon, and little did he know then just how much trouble it was going to cause him. After getting into an intense water battle with Griffith, which he won, and yes, that's canon, Guts asks his new leader about the strange necklace around his neck. Griffith tells him that he bought it from an old gypsy fortune teller because she told him it would help him achieve his greatest dream. Also called the Egg of the King, it was said that whoever possessed it was destined to claim the 
world in exchange for their own flesh and blood. Guts is momentarily shocked by this claim, but Griffith thinks it's sort of a neat representation of his own ambitions, which he then tells his newly acquired soldier. But we find out things about Griffith's Behelet that even he doesn't know in the fifth chapter of Berserk proper, titled Nosferatu Zod Part 4. After the Immortal One thrashes Guts about like a ragdoll despite his impressive display earlier, he moves in for the kill. His advance is interrupted by the rescue team dispatched by the Band of the Falcon, being led by Griffith himself. The White Falcon leaps into battle fearlessly and manages to reach his wounded raider's captain, but they are cornered by Zod. Despite executing a successful pincer maneuver that takes one of the Immortal One's arms, the pair are knocked out again, with Zod both relishing and lamenting the fact that he both found and was about to lose his greatest fight in 300 years. He made for Griffith first, no doubt wanting to savor killing Guts, but he stops short of doing in either of them. That's because he catches a glimpse of the thing hanging around Griffith's neck, the Egg of the King, aka the Crimson Behelet. He mutters to himself how a cub like Griffith could be in possession of the Crimson Behelet itself, and muses about what the God Hand might be planning. But once he realizes what kind of ploy it is, he breaks into a sinister laugh, tears open the roof, and leaves Guts with an ominous warning. If he could be said to be a true friend of Griffith, then he should take heed, because when his ambition falls, death will pay a visit to Guts, a death there is no escaping from. He flies into the night sky after manifesting raven black wings, but it is Zod himself from whom we get most of our information on the Crimson Behelet. The next time he surfaces in the story properly is during the encounter between the Band of the Falcon and the Black Dog Knights. With the time of the eclipse nearing, Zod had apparently gone around telling other apostles to watch out for Griffith because he was the fifth, and in possession of the Crimson Behelet. The Apostle Wilde, who had been set loose upon Griffith by the King of Midland, planned to use his Behelet to reincarnate again, as he was dying after his battle with Guts. When he finds Griffith without his Behelet, he loses his mind and tries to kill him, but that's when Zod intervenes and kills Wilde instead. Before departing the scene, he tells Griffith that his Behelet would return to him at his most desperate hour of need, because that's how it was. And sure enough, after Griffith tries and fails to commit suicide, Side following his rescue, the Behelet he had lost in the Tower of Rebirth bubbles up from the bed of the lake he fell inside of. In his moment of unbearable despair, spurred on by a singular desire, Griffith takes the Behelet in his hand, and the blood that flows into it from his veins activates it. Just then, the sun hides the moon, and it marks the advent of the fifth eclipse, which is the site of Griffith's rebirth as the demonic angel of longing, Femto, the fifth and so far final member of the God Hand. It is during this infernal rebirth ceremony that we understand how a behelet works even more. Chapter 76 of Berserk explains to us that only a person who possesses the traits to ascend to demon kind can activate a behelet. Or rather, it was only because they possessed these traits that they received behelets in the first place. Most apostles transform because of their deep desire to live in a situation that invokes deep despair. But the behelet Griffith possesses is different. The crimson behelet is only presented once in a cycle of 216 years to a human who is worthy to become kin to the God Hand itself, and thus it is only activated during an eclipse. But unlike a regular Behelet, the Crimson version seems to dissipate into the ether after serving its purpose, because to restart the God Hand cycle, it would need to find another chosen one a few generations after the last one. So in that aspect, it is perhaps the only Behelet known in the story which has been used multiple times over multiple generations. But this is where we must now stop talking about instances where Behelets were activated and start talking about what their activations mean for the world at large. What is a Behelet? the actual nature of Berserk's most evil key. In chapter 82 of Berserk, titled God of the Abyss, we see Griffith descend deeper into the bowels of the astral world after having sacrificed the Band of the Falcon for his own ascendance. He thinks to himself that it's funny. Even though his comrade's deaths are piercing through him, he feels nothing besides the sinking feeling his entire being was experiencing. As he keeps going deeper into the astral world, he sees a shimmering pool appear before his eyes, and an entity tells him that what he is seeing is the crystallization of the last tear he shed as a man. A flash of light reveals that the drops of the vortex are actually behelets, which the voice calls droplets of ideas that have spilled from this sea to eternity, summons to the other world. The last page of the chapter shows a massive heart-like entity with multiple eyes all over its skin greeting Griffith at the bottom of the abyss. People who have read the Lost Berserk chapter will recognize it as the idea of evil, but the chapter itself doesn't explain behelets beyond this statement.
statement. That duty goes to Flora instead, who finally explains to Guts what the Behelid is and how it functions. In Chapter 202, after reaching Flora's spirit mansion tree and spending some time unwinding with his party, Guts asks Flora about the Behelid and how to use it. Flora informs him that it's not as simple as using a turnkey to an iron door. A Behelid is a highly spiritual object that links a deep part of the astral world to the physical world. In its ordinary form, it is nothing more than a stone, but when it is found by the person for whom it was intended, it becomes a fetish capable of summoning the five angels. A Behelid can only be activated by the person it was meant to belong to. If it was used by someone else who happened to pick it up, it would not activate, but in the hands of the chosen ones, it could be used to exchange the thing that tethered their soul to humanity in exchange for being reincarnated into the world as an apostle. That's about where Flora's lecture about the Behelet and the God Hand ends, but she explains a lot of things about the nature of the object when taken in conjunction with what we learned from chapter 82. A Behelet is a key that is sent forth by the God of the Abyss, aka the idea of evil, to humans who have the characteristics for becoming demons. This is done seemingly through a random person's hand, but there is evidence that causality may be at work even there. In the case of Emperor Ganeshka, the wandering sadhu who gifted him his Behelet turned out to be his wizard general Daiba, so it's possible that the one who hands the chosen their Behelet is bound to meet them again in life at some point. When the owner of a Behelet reaches a point of despair so deep that all they can think of is their deep desire to live in any way possible, it activates by rearranging itself into a proper face which then cries tears of blood. The Behelet also emits a low decibel scream that cleaves open space itself, thereby summoning the God Hand's lair of the astral world. A summoner's blood is necessary for the ceremony to take place. Both times we've seen a Behelet activated, the first time with the Count and the second with Griffith, it was only after their blood flowed into the fetish that it activated. After being used in exchange for power, a Behelet doesn't vanish like a typical magical object. Instead, it might stay with its previous owner, like in the case of the Count, or be found by a new holder whose ownership over it is dubious at best. The prime example of this is the Behelet in Guts's possession. He has been carrying it with him since the end of the Black Swordsman arc, and has so far not been tempted into using it, though it wasn't for lack of trying. Technically, the Behelet he has is the Slug Counts, so it shouldn't activate if Guts willed it to. But when the Black Swordsman stumbled into Cliffhoth, the God Hand Slan tried to coax him into using it, despite other members of the God Hand having already stated his unworthiness. So there is a possibility that a Behelet might have more than one method of activation, but what muddies the waters further is the God damn behelet coated sword that the Skull Knight pulls out in Cliffhoth as well. After wandering the endless nights for a thousand years, the Skull Knight had accumulated and ingested multiple behelets, which he took from apostles he had either slain or found dead, like Rosine. He then refined them within his interiors, whatever they might look like, and managed to, I guess, melt them into a mass which he can coat and remove from his sword at will. All he has to do is literally swallow it. Called the Sword of Actuation in the Dark Horse translation, Skull Knight's sword channels the Behelet's power to cleave open space and delivers a sword stroke that can literally tear space open and send its target into the Vortex of Souls. This suggests that Guts might just give his Behelet to Skull Knight to augment his his blade, or make his own weird Behelet sword somehow, but what is more important is where Skull Knight's Sword of Actuation sends its victims. It sends them directly into the Abyss itself, which proves that the owner of a Behelet is destined to have their souls damned from the beginning, both Apostles and God Hands. So far, no new Behelets have cropped up in the series, but the one whose owner has been a mystery has not proved itself useless. Whenever immense malice and evil gathers in large concentrations at one location, Guts's Behelet res resonates with it, thus acting as something of a GPS for the astral world, especially its deepest layers. Also, if someone doesn't know how it works, you can definitely creep them out with it just by letting them annoy it until it opens its eye. Marvelous Verdict but that's about all we have on the Behelet for you guys. To put it simply, it's a key that links the deepest layers of the astral world to the physical world, and can only be used by those who are inclined to demon kind. They link said person's soul to the abyss in exchange for immense power as an apostle or a god hand, and have been manipulated into creating a space distorting sword so far. In our opinion, they are simultaneously the simplest and worst kind of portal tech slash magic in all of sci-fi and fantasy. That's it for our video, but if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one, be safe out there, and thanks for watching.